I think most of you are familiar with our panelists, but I'd like to begin with each of you giving a brief introduction of yourself, starting with you, Dan, on the end. Um, Dan Abrams, I'm the ABC News Chief Legal Correspondent, and for this purposes, I own a site called Mediaite.com, which covers media and politics, and my latest book is on Theodore Roosevelt and a big trial he was involved in. Hi, I'm Rick Stengel. Uh, my book that's out is called Information Wars, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation and What to Do About It. That's the smallest part, by the way. Um, I was the editor of Time Magazine for many years and then went into the Obama administration where I was Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, and the book is about combating disinformation from the State Department. Uh, my name is Van Gordon Sauter. I used to work in newspapers. Uh, and then did television and uh, other things. And I, I think my greatest distinction is that I was the least successful anchor man in the history of commercial television. <laughs> <laughs> and was fired. And I'm Norman Perlstein. I'm executive editor of the Los Angeles Times and in prior lives was um, a journalist working at uh, Bloomberg, uh, Forbes, uh, Time, Inc., and the Wall Street Journal. Where you were my boss at Time, Inc. Right. <coughs> Thank you. So for the first question, I'd love to hear from all of you. And Norman, if I could start with you. In 2019, August of 2019, the New York Times ran a headline that said, Trump urges unity versus racism. And the headline was met with immediate controversy. And the executive editor of the paper, Dean Baquet, called an internal staff meeting, at which there seemed to be two factions. On the one hand, were journalists who felt that in this era, the journalists needed to take a more oppositional stance to the administration, be more resistance oriented. And on the other hand, were the journalists who felt that the paper needed to be very careful not to do that, that they needed to continue to practice the big J journalism. Norman, what do you feel is the role in this era of journalism and specific to the Times, the LA Times, are you seeing a similar division within your staff? Sure, sure. Um, well, I think they're, they're several components to that um, August 19th episode at the New York Times, one of which was just with the word racism, whether that was a fair label for the president or whether, um, as I think an, an older generation of editors felt, um, that went to questions of intent. And uh, given that the president's predilections, you were never really sure whether it was racism <coughs> or sexism or gender, uh, uh, issues, and so um, that was one part of it. The second, I think, is the question of how much uh, opinion editorial uh, voice is appropriate in the news uh, sections of various journalistic enterprises. And I think with the um, growth of the 24-7 newsroom and with um, with the speed with which uh, news is disseminated, the longer follow-up pieces, be they in newspapers or not, are more akin to what magazines have traditionally done where there was a much more room for voice than is traditional in, in newspapers. And I think um, it's a trend that will continue. It's a, a difficult one to address, and uh, especially there's a sort of a side of that which is when the journalists who disagree with the positions of a particular publication go on Twitter to voice those disagreements, uh, which in, in terms of free speech seems totally appropriate, but in terms of understanding what the voice of a publication is can make it immensely confusing. Rick, Rick could I get you to comment on that? I know you have some thoughts. Well, yes, my boss. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think in the macro 30,000 foot view, we're at a real inflection point with journalism. I mean, we've been dealing with the fact that the economic model for journalism has, has basically gone away. Um, but to your point about, about the president, whom I call the disinformationist in chief in my book, I mean, there, and I've been in government and in journalism, there was always for a very long time a kind of compact between people in government and journalists. And the people in government tried to tell as much of the truth as possible, and, and people in journalism tried to discover as much of the truth as possible. But you never had a, a chief executive who doesn't try to adhere to reality or facts or truth at all. We know how to deal with a president who, who tells some fiction, 
uh, Bill Clinton, for example. We know, you know, even had a deal with a president like uh, Richard Nixon, who, who uh, uh, you know, committed uh, crimes that involved deception. We don't really know how to deal with, uh, um, with a president who I I is constantly a font of disinformation where there's very little resemblance to any aspect of the truth. I, I don't know how to deal with that. I mean, the, you know, one of the things that I say uh, in my book that's been a little bit controversial is that um, CNN had a whole lot more to do with the election of Donald Trump than Russia today. And why do I say that? Because they put him on for hours every night uh, giving free <coughs> advertising, free material to that without it being corrected. So one of the most substantial things that I think has to change, and, and you know, Norm it, you, is dealing with this every day, but how do you rebut falsehood in real time as quickly as possible? And I think that's necessary and, and, re, and a requirement it's very hard to do. But part of the problem is it, in traditional journalism, we have to repeat the falsehood to, to correct it. But all of social science shows there's something called belief echoes. When you repeat a falsehood, even to correct it, the falsehood gets embedded in your mind. And that is partially why um, he's been successful. And, and you know, the other thing I talk about in my book is this idea that, that the, the bad guys, in this, Putin in this case, uses our fairness and objectivity against us. I, the book starts with with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and annexation of Crimea, where Putin said over and over for weeks, there are no Russian troops in Crimea. That was a bald-faced lie, over and over, but over and over, we reported that. We felt compelled to report it, because here's a newsmaker make, making that statement. The question is, in this new era, is that something we should still do? And I don't know the answer to that. Van, you and I were just talking backstage a little bit about changes in journalism that you're seeing. Can you, can you weigh in on this? Well, I haven't been involved in journalism for uh, 25 benevolent years. <laughs> uh, but in the Reagan period, when I was running a news organization, uh, there was a general sense that the three networks and the major newspapers, of which obviously the LA Times was one, drifted a little bit to the left. And there eventually became an attitude that that was acceptable. It had something to do with the dynamics of the earth twirling about. And the journalists hated Reagan, abhorred his policies. He viewed them as a form of the locust, which would appear periodically and rack, ha cause havoc. But it worked. And Reagan won and ended up to be one of the most admired and appreciated presidents. And that relationship, that little tilt to the left, continued for years uh, until we ended up uh, uh, with Trump, uh, who, correctly said, represented all sorts of new challenges, most of them repugnant. Uh, but he was the president. And I think you can find many examples of our major newspapers and the television networks covering the president, his actions, or lack of them, with great objectivity. But there was another, there's another tier where the, I think, a liberal bias is increasingly embedded in the journalism as a result of the Trump experience. And it's, it's accelerating and deepening the wedge in our society between the left and the right. Well, Van, is that, Let is me that just part finish. Of Let me just finish. And my concern is that when Trump goes away in one or four years, that may not be corrected, that the journalists may be so comfortable with opinionated reportage and pieces and analysis that that just may become a condition in communications in our society, and I think it's going to be very detrimental. I'm sorry, go That's ahead. Right. Well, Dan, would you see that as potentially part of Trump's strategy? Because the more mm -hmm. news organizations skew to be more resistance-oriented, they're, in a sense, taking the bait and playing into his hands by seeding the ground of journalism and becoming what he has always accused them of being. Um, sure. Uh, look, I think that the first thing that would help from the media perspective, is to admit exactly what Van is saying, which is that the media and the people in the media are left of center, 
How far left are they? That's a subject for debate. Are they just a little bit to the left? Are they the far left? They're, they're, and there's no question in my mind that if you were to poll the mainstream media organizations and the people who work at them, there would be more people on the left than on the right, period. And I think that you have to kind of own that to start an honest conversation about where do we go from here. Um, and I think once you own that and you say, yeah, the media tends to be to the left of center. Let's just call it there for now. Then when you start talking about <coughs> what Donald Trump has done, then you can start talking, I think, about, okay, I accept that, but let's also accept the fact that when you hold the media to the standard the media is held to now, which is any sort of hint of bias, hint of rudeness on social media, or a tone that it's, that's might be viewed as sort of inappropriate, um, a story that they get wrong, it is huge news for the right, right? It's see, see, this is what you get from the left. And the, the answer is the president lies much more than the media does. There are many more errors and mistakes coming from the president than from the media. Um, and the problem is that many on the right just don't trust the media. And so the, the challenge becomes trying to convey that sense and that ability to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis the facts here. Who's right on this? And, and the media's challenge is we've got to try to get people to trust us. And when so many people on the right do not trust the media, it's a real challenge, and I guess that's why I'm saying you got to start by admitting that the media tends to skew left. Mm -hmm. But uh, can I back, just can say I something back. to that? So th there's nothing new with this idea that people in the media are liberal uh, and are Democrats. I mean, Pew started doing media polls 25 years ago, and they've gotten the media has gotten progressively more liberal, but from you know 75 percent to 80 percent. They do the same polls with higher education, right? academics and professors, same percentage, 75, 80, 85 percent are liberal. I agree, it's a fact. But the thing that I found that people in government didn't get, and I think all of us as journalists get, and, and I always said to people in, in government, yes, journalists are biased. They're biased to getting their story on the front page. They're biased to getting their face on the evening news broadcast. I never in my life saw a journalist not do a story because it may have violated his or her politics if they thought it was a good story. If, if you know, that if a reporter for the LA Times suddenly discovers that Donald Trump has solved uh, the Ebola crisis, uh, they're going to go with that story even if that person thinks that, uh, you know, that Donald Trump is off. But that's ignoring the subtleties of bias, right? That's, that's to basically say, look, trust us. Yeah, trust but how, us. I don't know how you can talk left-right when Mattis and Bolton and Clapper and Brennan are articulated as the enemies of the White House. I think it's, uh, you get into all kinds of troubles by going left, right, when what you're really trying to assess is what to do with rampant dishonesty at a level that we've never experienced before. And I think, Rick, you're absolutely right that in repeating the misdirections that come out of the White House is, is an extraordinary challenge for us. At one point, I played with the idea that whenever there would be a Trump <coughs> eruption like that, we would simply have a two-paragraph box uh, online or in print called pending verification. And what we would do is just print the assertion and not interpret it, not explain it, not try to figure out how it get, would get walked back and so forth. Um, I think in the end, our responsibility uh, really went beyond that, that wish of mine, but that seemed to be like the only way to deal with the failures that come when you repeat the lies. I, I, and I guess, I guess my concern is that people aren't gonna trust your boxes. And, and that, that my point <coughs> is you still need people who are going to say, I can trust their boxes. For you to come here and say, and, I, and I, you're right, this stuff needs to be checked in real time. But the bigger problem is that there, is pro there are probably no to very few, and you could say it's not about right left, conservatives who are gonna view the LA Times as their, as their main place of news. Um, right, just but not. I just think you have to, conservative and, and 
I'm well, not saying Trumpian. No. I'm saying I'm saying conservatives. I'm 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 expanding beyond Trump. I'm saying people who would can identify themselves as right of center, that there are probably almost none or very few who would consider the LA Times to be their primary source of news. It's not an attack on the LA Times, it's just a reality. Well, th there was a, a Pew poll the other day, uh, and I'm trying to remember it now, about news sources trusted by left and right. And one of the things that amused me about it, I don't know if people saw it, but um, that among Republican voters, who are often Trump voters apparently, um, that the news source they trusted overwhelmingly was Fox News. Right. Okay, so we can say that has its own biases. But the, the number two place they trusted was the BBC. Now, having been in government and having been in journalism, there's nothing more liberal and left than the BBC. Even, I mean, and even in America, there's nothing as left as, as the BBC. Part of the flaw, I think, of this, of this looking at what people read is this idea that journalists have that somehow I'm going to change people's mind by what I do, right? I mean, the number of times that journalism has changed somebody's mind in human history, I believe, are three or four times. I mean, people don't change their mind about things. The, but this idea that, that if we're objective somehow, people on the left or the right are going to uh, uh, appeal to us, that sort of idea has been destroyed. I mean, again, go, go to social science. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is that we seek out information that we already agree with. That's the reason that, that there is this divide, is that people who are on the right seek out sources of information they think confirms what they believe, and people on the left do the same thing. I don't know that the twain will ever meet, or it should. Dan, can I, can I stay with you on a related point? This week, Don Lemon at CNN is getting a lot of blowback because he is a declared straight news journalist and had a segment which seemed to reveal a bias against Trump <coughs> and Trump supporters. In a more general sense, how comfortable should we be with this separation that we seem to have accepted that there is a straight news side and an opinion side in cable or in, or in the newspapers, there's the news and the op-ed pages. Is that, is that a distinction that we should be living with? Well, first of all, I, I don't think that uh, Don Lemon would say that he doesn't give opinion on his show. I mean, I think he would... He, he seems to <coughs> declare himself to be a journalist. All right, maybe. Um, um, but um, with that said, look, I think convincing the public of the separation between the editorial page and the news page is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, it's very, look, when Fox says, for example, oh, you know, our opinion people at, at night and we have our straight news people during the day, and then you start evaluating and you say, well, there seems to be a lot of bleeding over into the same thing with MSNBC um, and to some degree CNN as well. Um, look, it, it's something that I think is, is a great separation that I think people you know, like Norm and people like Dean Bacay, et cetera, take really seriously, and I don't think the public appreciates how seriously that divide is taken and how much work goes into separating those with the walls that exist. Um, it is really hard to convince people of that. Um, and, but look, I think it's still I think it still exists. I think I'm not willing to just sort of throw up my arms and say, oh, you know, they're all the same, because I know how much effort goes into at both newspapers, online publications, and uh, on, the, uh, on the cable side of having some level of a, of a separation. Norman, can I come to you on this? Yeah, Do you see sure. bias bleed into the news side in print or elsewhere? Well, I think that the question of um, sort of liberal versus conservative um, is one, and that there uh, are certainly true that most journalists would self-identify um, as liberal rather than conservative, but that's not what we're dealing with here. Uh, unless you want to say that climate denial is solely uh, the province of the right and not the left, or that anti-vax movement is um, a product of the right rather than the left. These are the kinds of issues that, uh, if you will, have become much more important than, say, supply-side economics versus Keynesian economics. Uh, and what I find uh, so difficult in trying to cover this administration is, if you will, the ways in which um, anyone who disagrees with it is demonized as being, um, you know, to the, to the left of mainstream opinion. So if you take an example like environment, um, if you get someone like Jonathan Adler from Case Western, a very conservative environmentalist professor, 
uh, if you print a piece from him, you get all kinds of criticism from Trump's accusing him, you know, us of printing another liberal voice uh, far from it, but that, that that, if you will, that focus on left versus right is always been important in journalism, but that's not what we're really dealing with here. Mm -hmm. Van, can you weigh in on this? Well, I, 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 you know, I am a conservative. Uh, I must say that I read your paper and I find most of the stories about Trump that are real news stories are, in my opinion, acceptable. I might juggle this or juggle that and throw in a paragraph or a sentence, but I can't sit there as a news consumer and say, oh, oh, it's Norman and those wretched commies. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I think the paper does a good job. But once you leave that story, there are all sorts of pieces that are done, theoretically analysis pieces, where it is so clear what the, what the orientation of the writer may be. You're right. And then, that that and, I agree with. And then later in the paper, in the, in the entertainment section, in the book review section, there are all of these uh, 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 injected uh, anti-Trump observations. Uh, so I look at it and say, you know, I think whoever edits the news in that paper is doing a hell of a good job. But somehow, in those things on the side, there's a, a different form. Uh, in, in, in the mid-60s, in the mid-80s, I had lunch one day with Gene Kirkpatrick, who was uh, Reagan's chief foreign affairs advisor and the first woman uh, ambassador to the United Nations. And as was her wont, she began to throw bread at me about all the, all the liberals in the news business. And I said, you know, Gene, we're, we're trying to hire people that don't have any obvious orientation. And she said something to the effect, they all do. And the truth of the matter is, and I think you have it absolutely right, uh, our colleges, which are dominated by liberals, liberal professors, are churning out these students who never hear another opinion unless I'm their grandfather and they can't get out of my way. Uh, and and I, I, I think, you know, the, the journalistic population, which is made up of really well-motivated, delightful, articulate, erudite, engaging people. They've never got the message. And we tried at CBS to the degree that we tried because the feeling 35 years ago was really just below the surface. And you couldn't go to them and begin to say, hey, I don't like the tone of your stories, and it would provoke, excuse the French, a true shitstorm that no one had the time to cope with. Uh, and I, I think at some, some point, the editors, the producers, uh, are going to have to deal with this, because if we go in, in the next year or the next five years, with the circumstances we're in today, the, the, the conservatives, and believe me, Fox is a very thin sliver of the conservative uh, audience out there. Uh, that we're, they're going to be lost. And we need a journalism which is so clear and conscientious that the left and the right can find a credible place to believe they're getting the straight story. Is there a viable business model? if you don't model? have that, it's over. So, and is there a viable business model? Can, can, for the, all, all the people I know who watch cable news are junkie. They're not, you know, my mom, I, I say, are you watching cable? And she says, no. I'm like, well, you must be a happy person. You know, <laughs> they're, 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 uh, is there a business model behind news for the middle? Well, CNN uh, profits are certainly... Um, <laughs> I think the question was about a business model, and if somebody knows more about it than I do, please let me sit down and 
let you sit here, but last time I checked, it's a very profitable operation. CNN is a hugely profitable organization, and a lot of it comes from its international presence. And, and, not, and a small amount of it comes every time you walk into a, airports are just grotesque locations that none of us should be subjected to. <laughs> but the ultimate indignity is you sit there stark, raving, fearful of everything going on around you, and on the TV in front of you is this lemon man. And it's just unnerving. Uh, I, it, CNN is on every airport in America. Why is it that CNN, which no rational person watches on a regular basis, why is it that CNN, okay, I, you're, you know, you're here to hear my opinion. Yeah. I'm not here to argue about it. I don't understand why there's only one cable channel in LAX. And I would love to have your organization go and say, CNN is the least watched cable organization in America. Just why is it it's the only thing to see on the TV station? Well, partially they pay for that carriage in right. airports. Just the well, way I, they I get, they bid. Just yeah. the way they get paid by the cable networks for the carriage to their audience. I just want to make one, one distinction about what we we're all talking about, about general, this idea that there's straight news and then there's opinion there's also news that is a point of view. Um, and that has become the, the mainstream news organizations embody point of view journalism. What does that mean? I remember the first weeks I was editor of Time, and we were doing a cover story on the V-22 Osprey. Do people remember what that is? It was this tilt motor airplane that could be both an airplane and a helicopter. The Defense Department had spent billions and billions of dollars on it, and our long time a uh, military correspondent had written this cover story. It's about 5,000 words. And I read it. And you know, it was, on the one hand, you know, this is what's good about it. On the other hand, this is what's bad about it. And I read through the whole thing, and I thought, I, I don't really know what to think. And I turned to Mark, who had written it, had been a correspondent for 25 years, and I said, well, what do you think of the Osprey? He says, it's a goddamn waste of money. So I said, put that in the story. That's a point of view from an expert who has spent months reporting this, has talked to everybody about it, and, like, and has an expert opinion about that. Don't you want to know an expert opinion, which is a point of view about something like that? I do. But and, you, and our news business changed yeah. in the 80s and 90s, right? I remember when I became editor of Time.com, before I became editor of Time, and the mantra then, even online, and this was 2000, was, I want a second day story on the first day. Now, to all of us, we know what that means. But what that means is I want, I don't want to, he said, she said, just the facts, ma'am story. I want something with a, point, with a point of view. I want analysis. So if you look at the front page of the New York Times today, every single story on it is basically what would have been considered analysis 20 or 25 years ago. I actually think readers like that. Obviously, some people feel like it's opinion or it's bias, but it is bias from people who are actually expert and know immensely more than the rest of us do about the thing that they're writing Dan, about. Dan, I want to know what they're doing. But the problem is. is to get people to hear that, and let's put aside the example you give where it's not going to be as controversial, but to get to, to Van's um, utopian state, right, where the media has gotten to a point where when they say something, people can believe it. Um, the first way we're going to get there, I think, because is to say, for example, that CNN now is, has become the anti-Trump network, all right? Now, you can say they used to be somewhere in the middle, and I think there's an argument there, but they're not anymore. They make it clear in the Chirons, they make it clear at every point that it's an anti-Trump network. The problem with that is that most of what they're doing, the vast majority of what they're doing in their fact-checking is, is true. What they're saying in the criticism when they're calling out the president, on the, but no one on the right or in the center in many cases is going to listen to them because they're viewed as an anti-Trump network. And my point is, if we want the public to hear and if for it to actually resonate, there has to be a level of honesty about where we're coming from, who we are, the position you're coming from, and then <coughs> I think you can hopefully take steps forward to get to that point with the analysis piece, with the objectivity, with the fact checks, where people will say, okay, uh, I believe them, 
Because these fact checks, it is, it is true that the president is lying again and again about a, about a number of issues, on key issues. Um, it's become as a matter of course. That's not because I don't like the president or don't like the president's policies. It has nothing to do with that. Journalism used to be about trying to assess facts. That's the thing journalists take most seriously, is being the fact checkers. And the problem is that so many people out there don't believe us and, and don't take what we're saying seriously because they view us as an arm of the left or as an arm of whatever it is. And look, and by the way, I think the beginning of that dissent happened with the media's love affair with Barack Obama in 2008, um, particularly in the campaign, even if you look at the primary with Hillary Clinton. It was this, you know, he was treated differently than any other candidate. So when I say media, I don't mean a particular entity. I mean the, the whole, and there's a danger in sort of talking about the media as a whole, but I remember thinking all the time that the media's love for Barack Obama in the 2008 election, I think was part of the reason we're at the point where we are, particularly with people on the right and in the middle. Well, I, I think, think there's a glamorization of the past as this great utopia where facts triumphed over uh, opinion is ridiculous. Um, I grew up in a Republican family, but had uh, a Democratic uncle who would say to me every time he saw me reading Time, he would say, life is for people who can't read, time is for people who can't think. And that was the mantra <laughs> he had because <laughs> under loose, Time was such a predictable voice of conservatism, uh, a particular voice kept uh, China out of the UN for years. Um, and it was only really when uh, Henry Grunewald came in as editor in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, that it became um, less conservative than it was at that time. Um, at, you know, if you think about Citizen Kane, you think about Hearst, you think about the, uh, the role of opinion in his publications, um, this is not some new reality. What I think is the main differences that we have to come to terms with today are one, um, a, a president who is unique in, in history in terms of what he calls in the art of the deal truthful hyperbole, um, and the ways in which technology, uh, particularly uh, Twitter but other things as well, end up with people asserting opinions uh, for that may not be uh, really consistent with the publications they work for, which, is a, which goes to the whole fake news issue that we have to deal with at the same time we're trying to continue to cover uh, the head of government. Dan, if I could come to you with, with sort of a historical context on this, with regard to tension between a White House administration and the media, that's always been there, and to some extent it ought to be, right? The, the, you need to be held to account. Uh, President Obama, during his administration, said, there's this one network that's out to oppose me at every turn. And I think in his administration, he felt that Fox and conservative media were, were his resistance. Trump feels he has his other resistance. To what extent are we now in new ground, really, or is this more of a matter of degrees? Look, every president thinks that they're being treated unfairly. Uh, by the media, um, you know, particularly you even just look into recent history, Bill Clinton uh, would constantly talk about how unfair he thought that the, the media coverage was. And I can tell you that, you know, in, in my book on Theodore Roosevelt, um, which is about a trial where he was sued for libel, he had actually, um, at the end of his second term, used the Department of Justice to charge uh, two media entities um, criminally for saying things about him that he said weren't true. Um, and he had sued another media organization, et cetera. So, so the idea of a tension between the media and a president is nothing new. But the way that this president is using that to try to make all facts um, opinion is different. Uh, I think there is the usual presidential complaining about the media, and then again, you can talk about the, the left-leaning media, which again, I think is a fair conversation uh, to have. But it is also the reality that what this president is doing is different um, in terms of, and this goes back to the focus of Rick's book, 
um, on you know, the use of literally lies um, and misinformation to sometimes try and combat uh, what are clear facts. So to, to that, that the good point, I, want, I, have a, I quote a Russian journalist in, uh, in my book talking about what Putin does. And my book is, is, is called Information Wars. And he said, to Putin, it's not an information war. It's a war on information. And by that he means is that the, the Putin idea is to question the idea of whether there are empirical facts or not. That is a serious problem for our society and civilization. What, what Putin has always done is, is not saying my way is correct and you're wrong. He's saying don't believe anybody. Nobody is trustworthy. Um, that's a scary thing and that is continuing to happen now and I believe that, that Trump does something very similar. I want to make a point about what we were talking about, about this idea of objective journalism, which we're all kind of uh, salaaming before. I would say that is absolutely an outlier, not only in our history, but in world history. All through American history, from the founding period till the 1940s <coughs> or 50s, yeah. every newspaper was either a Republican or a Democratic newspaper. They had a point of view. Every European country has newspapers that, have, that are affiliated with a party. This idea in Europe that there's such a thing as objective news, they'd think that was crazy. That's an anomaly. So I actually think this period that we had where that we sort of all grew up in will look back as kind of a golden age because journalism will have a point of view. But one of the things I, I propose for this, and it's similar to what Dan was talking about, in my book I say we don't have a fake news problem, we have a media literacy problem. And by that I mean that people are less and less able to understand the provenance of information, where it comes from, what's a fact and what is not. And one of the things I propose, which you can do online now is, and all journalists hate this, uh, is that we become radically transparent. Every news story is radically transparent. You write the story. There's Adam Nagorny from the New York Times. Adam, you write your story, but then online you have a, have a link to all of your interviews, to your notes, to your outline, to the photographs that were taken, to your notes from the books that you read for the story, so people see, wow, look at all this work that came in here, and wow, Adam didn't use that quote from you know, Senator Jones, and people can make their own evaluation as to the veracity of that story and know what went into it. Will every reader do that? No, but it will, I think, make people trust and understand what this process is, and it will be, the stories themselves will be an example of media literacy because they'll teach people how a story is made and constructed. Rick, I, I want to follow up on that point because you're talking about analysis and opinion having been there then and now, and, and it's really the same, but the difference is the trust is gone. And so we talked a bit about polling earlier. And I brought some polling information here that I want to talk about. So the Gallup poll, there was one last fall about American trusted media at 41%, which is hovering near all-time lows. Uh, there was a Pew Research study for American trust in government also last year at 17%, one seven, also hovering near all-time lows. So the question to anyone on the panel is, how can we do better? Rick, maybe start with you. You've had a post in both government and media how, what is a way forward to rebuilding trust? You know, I'm, I'm always a little skeptical about these polls of trust in government, for example. Um, and again, it has but, been... Uh, sorry, by the way, the, the high, the American trust in media, it, it was 72% in 1976. And it's sort of been a, a drift right, down over, over the years. Down. But it was high, um, I remember, when I was a kid. And I remember government told me, if I put my head under the desk, I, I will survive a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> <coughs> you know, there's, there's actually good reason to not trust the government in certain circumstances. I wish, I wish people had a greater understanding of what government does. I think one of the things that government has done very poorly over the years is explain what government does. And, and I was, when I was in the Obama administration, I always was talking to the Secretary of State or sometimes the President saying, let's explain why we do this. Let's explain how people get electricity. Let's explain how they get water. Let's explain how the roads are made. These are the things that government does for you. So people feel like, well, I guess there's a good reason that I'm, I'm, I'm paying my taxes. So I actually think uh, in, a, in a republic, there's a healthy skepticism of government and the numbers should probably be not as low as 20%, or as high as 70%, but somewhere in the middle. And the role of the press, I, you know, I can't say this enough, is, is to hold government accountable. They, the press um, uh, has an adversarial relationship with the government, whether 
Donald Trump is president, whether Barack Obama is president. Again, I'll tell you, Barack Obama used to complain privately all the time about his treatment of the press. As you say, every president yeah. feels poorly treated. And, and that, in a way, is evidence of the fact that it isn't, wasn't a love song to him constantly, just like it's not a love song to the current occupant. Dan, can I come to you with a slightly different question on that? The American trust in media is at 41%, but if you look at that across party lines, which we've alluded to, 69% of Democrats trust the media, while 15, 1-5% of Republicans trust the media. That, that's the entire Fox News business plan in one poll. Rupert Murdoch looked at that and said, I'm going to create a news product to address that gap. So how can we do better, how can the media do better to build trust with the Republican side? Uh, maybe I could go Van. Yeah, let Van and, take it first. Uh, <clears throat> to uh, build trust with the Republican side of the country, which is really what's at issue here in that well, poll. I will go back to what Dan said, is accept the reality. Recognize the severe uh, mm -hmm. dislocation that's occurring. And quite frankly, I think it's getting progressively worse. Uh, I, I think one of the, th I, <clears throat> we had on Sunday in Los Angeles a ghastly event with the death of uh, Kobe. And uh, Norman's newspaper which times drives me to fits. But Norman's newspaper responded to this on a Sunday when normally staffs are somewhat depleted <coughs> and took a story that related to an accident, to a celebrity, to a sports person, to an issue about why did it go wrong in that chopper. It went across the spectrum of that story and throughout the day, just owned that story dramatically. And it, to me, as I said to him earlier, it was a Pulitzer Prize performance. The truth is that we have journalism practitioners from the top to the bottom who are incredibly skilled and, and, and can rise to occasions where they're, whether they're on a, a battlefield in Tunisia or whatever it might be in the service of their audience. I think what we need is newspaper management that says, I have a problem, and I'm going to try to alleviate, alleviate it, diminish it, make some adjustment in it for the long-term value of the journalism. I know from my experiences, when you try to do that, there's a lot of people in the news organizations will begin to see it as some form of censorship. But I think, I think the management of the newspaper, not the ownership because they're strange people or organizations, but I think it's the management that is going to have to come to grips. Not the journalists on the street or in the White House or on Air Force One. It's the management, the guys like Norman who work 18 hour days trying to get this stuff in the paper in a coherent, readable, rewarding fashion, who are have, going to have to engage it or not engage it. Dan, Dan, we've got about 70 seconds, seconds, but you're a TV guy, so I know you're going to crush it. No, no, the th 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 <laughs> 30-second um, answer is, I think part of this is when these papers and these um, television networks, et cetera, hire someone who is a conservative, and I'm going to, you know, Brett Stevens is here. Um, you know, he gets so much grief at, at the New York Times because the mass audience there doesn't agree with him on most of the stuff or a lot of the stuff that he ends up writing. And I think that, that a lot of, and this goes back to management, is I think that if this is the goal, and it may not be the business model, the, the goal may be, you know what, we're just going to put our hands up. If the goal is to bring some conservatives into the fold, they have to go for it by hiring them. They have to back them up when they say things that are unpopular. And I think that that can help. And I think that they, that has to be outreach. Norman, Norman 20 well, seconds plus OT. One last thing is, again, just to distinguish between innate skepticism of authority, which I think is very much a part of journalism, and then that, that left-right bias that you're talking about. For example, while we've all talked about Washington through most of this conversation, at the Los Angeles Times, we deal with a city, county, and state, all of which are controlled by the Democratic Party, and all of whom uh, have similar criticisms of us from what you've heard today. <laughs> so, yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I wish we had another hour. Thank you. Thank you.